Hi. As we reach a turning point in our studies, where we're closing out our preparatory module that deals with the methods that underlie all our history, I wanted to just kind of make some comments looking back, looking forward. So one is that the work you did here as you learn how to think like an art historian is giving you an initial introduction to fundamental tools and concepts. Look, that's what I said, fundamentals of art history, um, that you will be practicing throughout the course. So in the spirit of practice, like a musician practicing the piano or a dancer practicing his or her moves, remember that you're going to keep revisiting them and you're refining them. You're going to use them over and over, but always, I hope, with a fresh mind to see what exactly they can bring to your understanding. So these page modules and the corresponding chapters in the textbook are not a one and done. Remember to go back and review them, even not necessarily to look through and word for word read, read every page, but to be kind of like revisiting a concept such as sensory investigation or formal analysis. It's like me training my border collie. I have to keep building, as we say in dog training world, the strength of her sit stay. And when it's really strong, I keep reinforcing it. And then I add on, well, heal and sit stay. So that's what we do as humans, but we do it ourselves. Um, so this idea of sensory observation, it links up to the idea of strong description. And this exercise is about you seeing right away how good you can be at description if you engage your senses directly, if you are thorough, precise, detailed, and very concrete as Annalise is. It's round, but it's not a perfect circle. There are small pinpricks over the entire surface. Look at how concrete and specific that is in terms of the observation and the language itself. There's a small white, green, brown stem remnant. There's a wrinkled top. It makes a large thud when dropped on the floor. There's a slight citrus scent. So you have an innate ability to describe well when you are paying close attention. And I want you to be doing that all throughout when you study art. And when you encounter new artworks, I want you to think, how does this appeal to my senses? Because artworks address an audience the way a speaker does, but they address it not through words, but through your senses. So this might make a thud if it was thrown on the ground, just like Annalise's object. And I want you to notice when the textbook or my module pages describe an artwork in a way that makes clear to you its power because that's one of your jobs. So in this initial thinking like an art historian module, you also explored the power of precise terminology, a big theme that we'll be practicing again and again. So I want to encourage you to use the textbook starter kit and introduction like a dictionary so that you can revisit terms. New terms will be coming up. Many terms are not exhausted in one visit. Often the best way to really understand and feel, feel confident about terms is to link their concepts to specific artworks. So often terms that are seemingly simple actually require a lot of thought to really grasp the richness of what they mean. And Jessica brought that up very well when she talked about how it's hard to grasp space. Why is it important? You know, we think of space as just something we move through as a kind of emptiness that we don't pay attention to. But artists are different. If you are a visual artist, a sculptor, a painter, a weaver, this is also true if you're a dancer, you are working with space. Space is part of what you're actually creating or responding to or activating. So I said here in my response to Jessica that, you know, space is a very expansive concept. But in order to deal with its expansiveness, let's start with the fundamentals. In this class, we're going to be thinking a lot about two-dimensional artworks versus three-dimensional. So two-dimensional artworks being flat surfaces, paintings or drawings, often weavings are, 
often prints are, photographs are, and then there will also be sculptures, which are three-dimensional. So a, a sculpture that carves actual three-dimensional block of marble that has height, width, depth, length, this exists in space, in three-dimensional space, with a push and pull that is very complex and has all sorts of moments of depth and pressing forward and pressing back. It's unfortunate that we wind up studying sculptures like this in photographs because they're actually meant to be experienced directly with your senses in three-dimensional space itself so that you could walk around it and look at it from the back and see how your views change as it unfolds and how you relate to the twist and the torque of this figure that is about to hurl a stone and you have this sense of coiled tension about to unleash. You would feel that differently if you could be in actual three-dimensional spatial field with this figure. So that's a very different way of treating three-dimensional space than Sergeant Johnson, this artist who created this wonderful sculpture titled Forever Three in 1933, where he has the, the figure of the woman who is a mother figure, because if you look carefully, this would be much better again if we could see it in real life. You can actually see the children that she's holding pressed against her. She is a figure of maternal power and grace and of dignity and survival in the face of a racial apartheid system that persecutes black women and their children. But this is about her strength and fortitude to bear up under that and to protect her children. So he's choosing a compact form, a density that suggests the intensity, both spiritual and physical, of her effort to take care of her children. And he's thinking about African sculpture, which often uses these kind of compact figures to create a sense of spiritual power. So here's another twist. Paintings are literally two-dimensional. They have, they have height and width, but they have no depth. And some paintings are very frank about that, where they're just dealing with the fact of a surface and flat colors and patterns on that flat surface. But there's also a tradition of paintings that create an illusion of three-dimensional depth on a flat surface. And that illusion can be very powerful, as when artists use, as this artist, Raphael, use the technical trick that's called one-point linear perspective, where the lines in the painting are mapped out and measured at systematic ratio so that they converge mathematically together at a vanishing point. And the eye is fooled that there is a consistent deep space. So the textbook was taking you through the various devices that artists use to create that illusion of space when they are helping you to see how our eyes accept an illusion when we have a picture plane we have a foreground, a middle ground, a background, when we have different ways of creating an imaginary space, overlapping, diminution, and so on, including linear perspective. And they didn't give you a very good, um, <laughs> I didn't love their chart that much about linear perspective. I think it could be better. But just think of railroad tracks in a, in a cartoon where Bugs Bunny is running toward the, the point where they seem to converge, or just when you're driving on a freeway. And off in the distance, the freeway appears to get narrower and to reach a point. That's a trick of our eyes limitations that artists exploit. So then you started to learn and apply the concept of iconography and iconology. And all of that is going into another part of our project, which is building a historical consciousness. An awareness that the way we live and see and do things now is not how it was in other times and places. And that artworks express the values and perspectives of people who lived in a very specific time and place, a historical world. So our job is to reconstruct 
how the artwork spoke to their original audience. So if you take the time to skim through the rich array of historical moments and cultures in the class, in the textbook, I mean, each one of these requires an understanding of the historical world of South and Southeast Asia, where Buddhism and Hinduism arose, or the historical world of ancient Greece, or the historical world of the arts of Africa up to the 16th century. And that will be our job, balancing all of these things as we go forward.